tell me what, like around 2004, I think, mm -hmm. what was going on with you? Well, I guess technically, technically I was, I was basically having kind of a mental breakdown. You're listening to the Sub Pop Podcast. I am Arwen Nix, and today's episode is a conversation with Alan Sparhawk from Lowe. Lowe was in Seattle on tour recently, and Alan said I could come and talk with him at his hotel. So if it sounds like we are in an empty ballroom with an enormous air conditioning unit, that's because we are. Okay. So 12 years ago, Alan was on tour with Lowe, and he and his wife Mimi had started the band in 1993. Sub Pop began working with them in 2006. But it was 2004, and the band was on tour in Europe for their record, The Great Destroyer. And Alan was in his early 30s, and for more than a year, he had been really depressed. Like, really, really depressed. He was battling what he described as episodes. It would be a day or two stretch where he would just be so out of it. When you're in your early 30s, it's pretty, at least, for, at least for men, it's pretty common that if, if you're going to hit the wall, you usually hit it about then, because that's sort of when you're, that's sort of the moment where your, your youth, youthful arc <laughs> collides with the inevitable and, and of life. So Alan felt off. He was smoking a lot of weed or using whatever came across his plate, and he went to the doctor to try and see if maybe some medication would help. Which, to be honest, was probably the most treacherous part of the whole process, I think, when, they, when they're trying things, you know, like, here, try this. And I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, you, you have to wait for weeks to tell whether something is working or not, or tell whether it's going to hit you adversely. And, um, yeah, it was weird. It was kind of a collision of many things, you know. So while on this tour in Europe, Alan has basically stopped sleeping. He is not performing well. On stage, he will start songs that only he knows or songs he only knows half of, songs that no one else in his band knows at all. And he would spend time incoherently rambling on the microphone. And it was really hard for his bandmates. It was just real uncomfortable as a performer, probably. And then as, a, as you know, as my wife and essentially my best friend, you know, watching me sort of fall apart and, and become very, and really, really not, not in control of myself. And then... You know, I had a notebook that I was writing in madly, and you know, that's a pretty common thing for people when they're, when they're starting to hit the wall, you'll, you'll write a lot in a notebook. And I had millions of ideas of how to fix this, and I had inventions, and oh, I know how we could do modular housing for the military, and you know, all, this, all these things. And, and uh, everybody around me, of course, was just getting nervous and manifesting their, you know, their, everybody was dealing with it differently. My, my wife was very, very patient, of course, and you know, my kids were very young, probably just didn't even know what was going on. They were. Dealing, dealing with being on tour, you know. And, but yeah, you know, Zach, who was our bass player, you know, very, you know, was, was very uncomfortable with what was going on. And when we got back from that tour, um, you know, he, he said, I just, I just can't, you know, you, you gotta go do something like that we can't deal with anymore, so. When the tour was over, Zach was one of the many people close with Alan who asked him to go and get help. And then Zach quit the band. And again, Alan also knew something was wrong. But at the same time, he felt like he was going through something important. Like whatever he was getting to, he needed to get there. So Alan was talking to his wife, Mimi, and he said, I need to go spend some time in the woods. And she said, okay, but please take this friend of ours from church. And so the two of them, Alan and his friend, went out to a cabin. Yeah, as soon as I got out there, it just, it just, it was very weird. It was just, just really, my grasp on reality really took a dive. I started, started getting delusions about, I was, I believe that there was something sort of spiritually cosmic going on and there was going to be some, you know, it could be a little bit tied in with religion and sort of the second coming of, of Christ and sort of the conflict between good and evil and, and light and darkness and stuff. And I, I had this specific part I needed to play and I needed to just sit tight and close my eyes and 
stop speaking, which I did for a few days. After a few days of Alan not speaking and not opening his eyes, his friend was able to convince him to get in the truck and head back to town. And when he got back, his friend took him to the hospital. I was still pretty delusional, but I guess part of me just just, just had kind of surrendered and really didn't... I don't know. I, I guess I felt like I'd been sort of trying to convince everybody that I was okay for so long that at that point I, I, I just kind of gave up. So Alan got some sleep. He opened his eyes again, but he was pretty pissed off. In his mind, what he was going through, this important thing, this journey, had just been stopped in its tracks. It, it's, it's like the whole pathway up to that made it makes sense. It's like, well, of course, this is where we're going to, right? And, and, in, and it's really... In some ways, it's a really great feeling because all the time coming up to that, you're like, what is going on with me? And part of you is going, what? there's something wrong here. What, what's the deal? And then when you become del- completely delusional, you realize like, oh, oh, this is what's, up. This is what's going on. I'm the Antichrist. And this is, this is, you know, it's just, this is me just waking up to who I am. And, you know, I'm, I'm, that's, at a certain point, that's literally who I thought I was. And, and, and you thought you were the Antichrist. I thought I was the Antichrist, but sort of in a... But more in a, not, not so much in a sat, you know, I'm Satan and I'm going to kill Jesus. And it was, but it was more of a yin and yang thing, kind of like... Kind like of there's like good in the, in the cos- world yeah, and there's then good there's... In the, there's, you know, and if, if there is a figure that encompasses grace and, and good and just, you know, and, and, and love, then there has to be a counterpart to that, you know, a representative that then is the representative of the imperfection of man and I guess you know that to me fed into it fed into an upbringing of you know I'm, I'm Mormon I grew up Mormon and there's there's some very very heavy and very fil- even even sort of existentially philosophical concepts in that that, that in some ways really really can, <laughs> can open the door to to a, a pretty wide and kind of cosmic view of, of God and, and who we are as humans and so so in some ways that you know that became the the language of of delusion and yeah you get you get when when that f- slowly dissipates and you realize no no you were just just delusional and you're this is how you're gonna be <laughs> So this is what you were realizing after some rest in the hospital? Yeah, yeah. As you're in the hospital, you kind of realize that. And, you know, family members and friends coming and visiting you, and they have kind of that odd look on their face, like, that you start recognizing and and stuff. And it's just, yeah, it's weird. Like I said, you just, you feel like you're, you feel like you're, some a journey or some sort of process that some sort of metamorphosis that you needed to go through has been disrupted. <laughs> the way he describes it, the unit he was in was not set up for helping people who are going through what he was going through. Many, if not most of the other patients, were coming down off of meth. So after five days, even though they wanted him to stay longer, Alan decided to go home. I leave, I very, very happily go home and start smoking weed again, which I still, to this day, I really believe was, was pretty key to coping and, and, and eventually sort of, sort of getting, getting my, getting a little bit of clearance from this, uh, exercise, um, running kind of in the midst of when I was sort of going a little crazy and obsessing about things as they went along. A good friend of mine was like, hey, let's go, let's go running. You know, you should go running. Let's go running. Come running with us. And I mean, I was loopy enough at the time. Like, yeah, okay, okay, that'd be great. You know, and so, yeah, so exercise was pretty key. But uh, yeah, I mean, I went home and, you know, Everybody around you is <laughs> kind of stepping lightly and 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 trying to be trying to be nice and, and trying to deal with something that they've never witnessed before and 
and of course you know you don't you don't just go and get fixed you know it takes a long time and you're still very sick Alan had a very hard time with the different medications the doctors were trying on him and when he heard the news about the passing of Chris Cornell he immediately thought of his own struggles when we heard we were in China when we heard when, when Chris died I remember hearing kind of some of the first few days, some of the information kind of trickling out, some of the medications he was on, and I remember just, uh, as soon as I heard that, I was just like, oh, jeez. You know, and it just, that was like the most sinking feeling to me, because I mean, I've, I've, I've definitely experienced, like, like, medications, the medications are so, so gnarly and so treacherous, you know. I mean, yes, sometimes they're, they're important and boy when you're in a really acute situation and if you're in a hospital or something like that then yeah I mean they, you know they, it's sometimes it's kind of the only way to get yourself out of something but man when they would try stuff on you I mean I I mean I I mean I I, I mean I had I had a suicide attempt I, I, I swear off I, and I really contribute a lot to the to like this the medication that they were trying on me at the time, I just remember it just, it just, it would just, it was very weird, you know, but you know, the classic thing, like, oh, it makes you numb and whatever, and you don't think, it was like, kind of, but so, some of them, they're just kind of scrambling things, and you're like, well, you know, it's like, it's like this motor spinning, and you're not seeing a lot of the things that are around you, and you're like, like you it's almost like you're standing outside yourself watching this automaton making decisions and you're like wait a minute do we think about it? no like oh well, here's this and so when I heard about Chris and, and, and stuff I'm like hey, well yeah this yeah yeah it would it would I mean anything that messes with that moment of like okay what's going on here I mean if you can't do that if you can't do that then you're gonna get in trouble man I mean, if you don't have that capacity to have a little part of your brain that goes like, okay, wait a minute, who's, who's running the show? Then you're, you're going to find yourself just, just drifting on the wind. And it's, so I don't know. I don't, I wouldn't know necessarily go far, so far as to, say to people like hey if you're having a tough time don't take medication but man be really careful and just be really conscious of the fact that that is a whole nother factor and just I mean I don't know I feel like doctors need to be need to stress more They're like look we're gonna try something on here but you need to really keep your eyes open and if this is throwing a new wrench in an already difficult machine then then you need to let us know right away I want to be clear Medications are a godsend for many people who suffer from mental illness. But over the years, Alan has found what works for him. And what it is, is sleep, good diet, lots of exercise. And all that's easy when you're at home, but it is a hell of a lot harder when you're on tour all the time. And so Alan told me he tries to get in some running every day, that there's something important about just moving, going left, right, left, right to get your two sides of the brain talking to each other. It's a lesson he says he took from when he did some EMDR therapy. That stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing. I mean, a brief description of it is it's, 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 it's talk therapy that's sort of mixed in with a little bit of maybe what maybe looks like hypnotism or something. What you're doing is is stimulating the left and right side of your brain kind of back and forth. It'll, sometimes you'll watch a light that goes back and forth. Sometimes you listen to the same, some beeps that are kind of going in the headphones and go left and right, left and right. The, the theory is that the back and forth is this really very primal, simple way of getting the hemispheres of your brain to start communicating and talking back and forth, which when you're depressed and when you're under trauma, that does not happen. What happens is what the left and right does is kind of get your brain to kind of start communicating. And meanwhile, you're talking, you know, if there's something that's that day that's you stressed out about, you can talk about it. And, and it's interesting is what I've found as, as this is going is, you know, as you're talking about what's going on, it'll 
for some reason your subconscious will open up. It'll, it seems like everything gets blurred a little bit and you start getting, you're like, oh yeah, no, I remember now sitting with my mother and her saying this or this, or I remember being under this thing that looks like it has bars on it or something, or, or you're like, oh, I remember something. Yeah, it's very, very weird. You'll, it'll kind of bring up stuff and the objective ultimately is to like, is to go to those places where there's trauma or memory or whatever and, and, and see it consciously and go, oh, okay, well, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not being sexually molested by, by these fucking teenagers in this car, you know, and, and so you can kind of say, okay, I'm here now. I'm fine. This isn't. This isn't happening. And the, ultimately, the idea is to then get your primal, your primal side of your mind to 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 let it go. So therapy helped Alan. Time helped Alan. And in the last dozen or so years since this psychotic breakdown, he says he knows himself way better. He can notice things he wouldn't before, or at least in a way he didn't. The sad thing about going crazy is that you've never done it before and you don't know what it is and you don't recognize it while it's coming. But once you have, of course, you you become a lot more aware of, of, of yourself and your, your consciousness and your subconscious and, and you, you can be a little more vigilant and understand it a little more, you know. Uh, yeah, you, you're a little more attentive. You can kind of see, okay, I'm getting stressed out here and, 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 and I know that if I do that for days, I'm gonna eventually start getting irrational and, and, and it'll start you know, cascading on a cell, and you're like, oh no, okay, now, now I'm not sleeping because I'm obsessing and stressing about something, and then that makes it worse. So you, so you, you look so for you the still, You, look you for the still spirals. deal with that sometimes? Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I still have, yeah, I'm still, still have bouts of depression, uh, little episodes that last for a day or two where I'm, I just, I just kind of, just get a real negative perspective and just get real down on yourself and have a hard time I don't know yeah I'm still I'm still trying to figure that one out I'm still I'm still trying to figure out what that is I still have these my wife is is has really been patient and, and good and we we you know, we've not we've known each other since we we're nine and we 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 communicate that I hesitate I suppose the answer is no I, I you know I I don't I I guess in many ways I don't just because that happened you know I mean you really you know if you if you if you thought you had your if you if you th thought you had it figured out before you know you, once you yeah once you have a little mental slap in the face it, it'll really kind of wake you up to that so you, you have to really really be vigilant vigilant so I, I guess I guess no just because I know that that could happen it, it happened once it could probably happen again uh, but but at the same time I'm I feel like I'm having gone through it I, I can see it I can see things coming I, I, I'm healthier now um, just just 
in my life and physically and, and what, I, what I do, which I, again, I think that was a huge factor. Um, do you love yourself? Ooh, that's... I don't know, I think, I think there's, I think everybody's layers. I'm probably about three layers. On the surface, I generally try to be positive and I like to be friendly and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm usually nervous if it's too quiet and I want everybody to be all right, you know? And then underneath, there's a layer of, layer of, of, actually I'm very, very frustrated <laughs> and very, and I, and I can be very negative and very um, impatient and and fatalistic, you know. And and uh, but I'm pretty convinced that way in there, there's a, there's a little child that's that is purely hopeful, and that for some reason that second layer can't get at. And it's been trying forever. <laughs> they can't quite get at this little layer inside me that, that I don't know, that's, that's the little layer that's kept me alive. And So maybe you love that little guy? I, yeah, I hope that when it's all over that that's the little guy that I really am. Um, but man, there's... Yeah, it's... it's that second layer is so powerful that you just almost don't want to visit the, the, the inner layer too much because you'll bring the, the outer layer with you. you know? But I don't know, after, after being delusional, you're really not there's there's a lot of stuff that you're not afraid of you're not afraid of much it's very weird i think once you once you believe that you're the antichrist you're kind of not yeah it's really weird like i'm not like like all those little things as an adult you carry over from a childhood there's like the tiny little fears of things like walking in the dark or like like walking through the woods and there's nothing there or something like that or stuff it's like as an adult, you still have those things a little bit, but like after you go crazy, it's, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so you feel maybe stronger now kinda than you did before? Kind of stronger. It's a little bit of a letdown because you're like, oh, there's no such thing as magic. And there's no such thing as this or this or this. And no, there's not going to be a weird boogeyman that's going to surprise me in the woods and tear my arms off and have glowing eyes and scare me or whatever you know that's, that's I'm you know, not disappointed by that no, I'm happy no, that there's no it's very, man. <laughs> but, on a, but, but on a real primal level like literally you can like like those little twinges of excitement or, or those little like ooh a little bit fear that you get as you like literally yeah like like walking into the forest in complete complete darkness like like, like you know I think generally people would be like a little nervous, but I guess I remember the first time I did that and realizing, like, wait a minute, that feeling is gone. And just and sort of searching inside your brain and realizing, like, oh, something's changed. You know, it's it's in the same compartment that that sort of now is skeptical of anything that like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that feels right. It's like, no. You know, that same thing. That same thing that made you made me question like okay it's the same thing that made me start from scratch with religion it's kind of like oh wait a minute all this stuff I thought I have to completely throw it out now and start from scratch because that mechanism for being able to tell what's true and what's not true is, is I know it's like that that completely pulled out from under you and how easy that can be pulled out from under you and you not know so I don't know. Yeah, you, you're more skeptical, but in a certain way, it's 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 a strength because everything, every little fragment that you do embrace and that you do know, so to speak, is 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 real and it's 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 be it's beyond delusion. 
Well, that's my hour. Oh, okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there anything that I didn't ask you about that you want to oh. mention? Wow, I don't know. I mean, this this has been great. I mean, there's there's so many so many things about it that you could talk about, and it's in, you know, it's obviously therapeutic to talk about it, but. I don't know. Yeah, I found it really encouraging. Just, just anyone, man. If you've gone, if you've gone through that, and you see someone else going through that, man, you gotta just keep, just keep talking to them, you know. And even if they've got this glazed-over look, like they're not even hearing anything you're saying, and they're acting contrary to what the advice you're giving them, you gotta, you gotta keep. It's, it's going in, you know. Yeah. It's, it's going in. It's just, that, man, when you're losing it like that. It's, a, it's chaos, man. It's the blender's running and stuff is flipping over and turning inside out, like, like at a, at a, at a, you know, at a pace that you, that, that, that nobody, you know, we can keep track of. So, so real, real love, real understanding. As long as it's coming in, it's it's vital and it's important. So if you know, if you ever, you know, if you, even if it doesn't seem like it's getting through you know you got to express to that person how much you care about them and, and that you're there for them and show them respect too. Show, them, show them respect and just show them that you're there for them and, and, and you know you you can you can trust that person's and still help them and keep them out of danger you can trust that person and and and, and, and someone who's going through that really desperately needs needs something and, and even if it's just a moment you know they're they're reaching for every 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 little every little fragment they can have they can grab onto that's real and that they can they can have hope and again even if it doesn't look like it's even being heard or if it's even registering and you, you gotta you gotta trust that it's it's helping Thank you for talking to me. Sure. Yeah. Good luck, everybody. And, uh, man, <sighs> careful. Be careful. Careful out there. An enormous thank you to Alan, to you, Alan, for talking to me about this. Um, it was a really important conversation for me, and I hope it's a really important conversation for our listeners. You can hear all of the music from today's episode at subpop.fm, or you can follow us on Spotify. Um, and we have also, again, put some resources up on the website for anyone who is dealing with mental health struggles. A special thank you to Alyssa Atkins and Stuart Fletcher, and thanks as always to the Sub Pop Brass, Chris Jacobs, Megan Jasper, and Jonathan Poneman. Bye, guys. <laughs>